can change the monitor now. I would like to do a little survey before I start my talk. Uh, I don't think that the translators will be translating this yet, but this is just something I want to know. How many of you started using computers before the age of, say, 15? How many of you started using computers before the age of 10? How many of you started using computers before the age of 9, 8, 7, 6, 5? How many of you were using computers when you were still in the womb of your mother? <laughs> Okay, you're the people I want to talk to. <laughs> How many of you are university students now? How many of you have a part-time job in university? Okay, thank you. We have another minute before I can start. There is, by the way, an imposter here at Feastly. There's a person going around who says his name is John Anderson Hall. That, of course, is crazy because that person is really named Mad Dog. <laughs> but for some reason, the registrars of Feastly this year decided to ignore that fact and expose my real name. You can ignore it. Okay, let's start. My name is Mad Dog, and I'm the president of Linux International, as well as being the president of Project Kawa. And the title of my talk is Project Kawa Update, let's go. I'd like to dedicate this talk to Dennis McAllister Ritchie. Dennis was one of the two people who started the Unix operating system. He invented the language C. He did a lot of things for Bell Laboratories as a researcher. He was an incredibly humble man. He did not like people making over him or making a big deal of the things he did. He died the same week that Steve Jobs did. And of course, while the press talked a lot about Steve Jobs, and I will not take anything away from Steve. He was a great designer, he was a great business person, and he built a multi-billion dollar company that employs lots of people. But Dennis, by inventing C, by inventing Unix that iOS and XOS are based upon, created a multi-trillion dollar industry and was little recognized at the press at the time of his death. I started Project Kawa in the year 2007. I came here to Brazil. I came to a conference like Feastly. And they said to me, Mad Dog, how do you make money with free software? Now, if you've been in the free software business a long time, this is an easy question to answer. Because you say to the person, 
if your name is not Bill Gates, how do you make money with Microsoft? You make money by solving a person's problem, by creating a solution to a problem. You install the software, you select the software, you integrate the software, you teach the customer how to use the software. All of these things you can do with free software as well as proprietary software. You can even sell free software, but by its very definition, it limits how much you can charge for it. But they still wanted to know how could we make money with free software. And I started looking at the problem closer. And a few years later, a person named Douglas Conrad, who started the company OpenS, a consultancy, with one person in it, himself. And now today employs 60 people supplying support and services for asterisk and telephony. Joined me and helped me to try and bring it forward. This year, another person joined us, a person with experience in marketing and communications, and we think we have the chance to bring it forward uh, finally in its final form. Now, back in 2007, the goals of Project Cowell were determined. And I want to point out that nowhere in this list of goals is there the goal of using free software. The goals were to create millions of new jobs here in Brazil and millions more in the rest of Latin America and millions more around the world. To make computers easier to use. Notice I did not use the word easy. This is like saying, I'm not going to make Richard Stallman happy because that's impossible. But I will make him happier. Okay. We'll create more environmentally friendly computing. People who feel they have to toss away their notebook every three years because it's no longer fast enough for them. Will toss away their cell phone every two years because it no longer meets their needs. We would like to fix that problem. And we want to decrease cellular wireless contention. How many of you go to campus party in Sao Paulo? It's a great event. 8,000 young programmers. I almost used the word geeks. I, I should use the word geeks. Between the ages of 18 and 32 congregate in this one large area and every year Telefonica says, this year wireless will work fine. That lasts about 10 seconds into the event. And then Telefonica hands out all these cables and says, here, here's your 10 gigabits per second. Because what Telefonica doesn't realize is that when you put 8,000 geeks into that small an area, they all want to download pornography as fast as possible. <laughs> and that overloads any wireless network. But we also want to create a completely free wireless Wi-Fi bubble over large urban cities. You can see this for yourself. Whenever you start up your Wi-Fi, you see lots of access points, oh, hundreds of access points. But they're all locked. And they're all locked for basically three main reasons. Number one. The person who has the access point is afraid that you're somehow going to steal all of their bandwidth capacity. Number two, they're afraid that you're going to do something illegal and the government is going to blame them for that. This is kind of ridiculous because the government does not blame the telephone company for you doing illegal things over copper wires. And number three, and this is the real reason why they lock it, is because they know you're going to be downloading pornography. And that will use all of their bandwidth. We want to be able to create low-cost or free supercomputing. 
Now, this has been done times in the past with things like, uh, oh, oh, I'm having a mental blank. Uh, the, the study at home. There we go. Study at home. Where study at home said, I'm going to use the spare CPU cycles on your desktop computer to do these large computational mathematical problems when you're not using it. Well, we're going to do the same thing, only better. And we're going to give you the capacity of some of the fastest supercomputers in the, in the world, in your house, for free. And we're going to do all of this, amazingly enough, through sustainable private sector funding. That means no money from the government. Now, I'm not an anti-government person. I don't hate the government. I think that most of the time the government really tries hard. It's just they fail. And like most large governments, they change their priorities and therefore they change their funding and it's something you cannot count on. But if you deliver people the proper goals and the proper features and the proper things for a reasonable price, they will pay for it. And that's what we're doing with Project Kawa. So the main idea of Project Kawa was not to create a large corporation that would have millions of employees because this would scare the government to death. But any time you create one entity with millions of employees, you're either going to create something like Microsoft which is self is bad, or you're going to create an army that's going to overthrow the government, which is the other thing that they worry about. So what we're doing is we're creating millions of independent companies that can all compete with each other, but they're only going to have one or two employees apiece. Now, there's a second reason for doing this, and that's the fact that in Brazil, if you want to start a real company, a company with 100 employees, it may take you six or seven years to go through the bureaucracy to actually get that stamp that says you are a company. And it costs you a lot of money. And President Lula, when he was in power, decided to fix this, to create what he called a micro-company that would have between one and two people apiece and would take a single day to create that company with a funding of perhaps 50 reais, a very small amount of money. And then you would become a real company with all the rights and privileges of a company, including opening up a bank account, protecting yourself against financial failure. And each one of these entrepreneurs would be responsible for delivering very good support to local customers. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. I'm going to tell you what it was like to program in 1969 when I started programming. When the computer that you were working on ran one program at a time. And there was a very, very simple operating system that went there. And the computer had maybe one quarter of a megabyte of memory, 256,000 bytes of memory, and ran at the speed of 100,000 cycles per second. And for this computer, you paid two and one half million US dollars to start. And that was when a million dollars was a lot of money. If you wanted to buy a disk drive, you could pay 32,000 US dollars for 180 megabytes. I give you an idea, my parents bought a brand new house with three bedrooms in the same time frame and they paid $32,000 for the house. So naturally, if you're going to hire programmers to program this machine, you're going to have people who are trained in the very latest of computer science. And so in order to touch the computer, you had to have at least a master's degree in computer science, if not a PhD. And 
the per if you couldn't figure out what to do, you turn to the person to the left of you and they also had a master's or a PhD in computer science. Or you turn to the person on the other side, they also had a master's or a PhD in computer science because they wanted the programs running on that computer to run the best they could. A few years went past, and that level of training went downstairs to the computer center. And you called down there if you wanted to have a question answered and have the letter, level of expertise. And a few days, a few years later, that went out to the vendor. And the vendor answered your questions about what was going wrong with their operating system and things like that. And the price of computers started coming down and down and down. And then there was this magic time, this very magic time, where they created something called time sharing. And time sharing was where everybody just had a terminal on their desk. They no longer had to use punch cards or paper tape or things like that. And all of the data and all of the programs are kept in one space, and there were these people who were trained very well to do backups every night, and they were called operators. And you wanted to be on the good side of the operators because they could make your life hell. And from that we get the term B-O-O-H. Bastard operators, no, B-O-F-H, bastard operators from hell. It comes from that term in that time frame, okay? But then, around 1977 to 1980, two people, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, put a mainframe computer on everybody's desk and said, good luck, sucker. They called them PCs, but they were mainframe computers with all of the responsibilities, the security responsibilities, the backup responsibilities, installing new software, and they gave these computers to people who had absolutely no training whatsoever. And that's where the things started to fall apart. So, what we want to do is bring that level of support and training back to the people who need it, back to the people who have the computers on their desktop or in their hand to show them how to actually use computers the right way. Project Kawa itself is a nonprofit educational organization. We are going to help to organize these million or million and a half or two million people and help them create this job, help them create this business. Now, when I first started this, I looked at Sao Paulo, Brazil. Interesting things about Latin America. 83% of the people in Latin America, that includes Central America, South America, 83% live in a city environment. Not in the rainforest, not on the deserts, not on the plains, in the cities. Sao Paulo is the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere. Mexico City is the largest city in the Western Hemisphere. New York, that's way down the list. Los Angeles, oh, that's way down the list. Sao Paulo has a population density 12 times that of Manhattan. The other thing you should remember is that 86% of all of the things produced or made in countries around the world come from small to medium business. In the United States, small business is one to 50 people. Medium business is 50 to 500. Everything above 500 people is considered to be a large corporation. In Latin America, small business is one to 30 people. And a million business is 30 to 300. And everything above that is considered to be a large business. So 86% of all the services and goods and materials produced are produced by small to medium business. And only 14% is produced by the large corporations. And you go, Mad Dog, how could that possibly be? What about all the cars? Yes, but the cars may be assembled by a large corporation, 
but all of the parts are made by smaller companies, sometimes relatively small machine shops that make the parts. So you take a look at those type of statistics, and then you, you look at Sao Paulo with all of those very tall buildings stuck very close to together, and you think about what's happening in those buildings. Some of those buildings are apartment houses. Some of those buildings are offices or condominiums. And if they're office buildings, a lot of those offices have 40 different companies in them. The buildings have 40 different companies, each one having a small number of people. And those companies cannot afford to have a full-time systems administrator. And so they train people in their office to take care of the computer. Typically, this person is perhaps a secretary. Or worse yet, they try and, change, they try and train the boss, the manager, who's even worse at it than the secretary. Because the manager takes it as, oh, I don't have time for this. The secretary at least says, well, this is part of my job. But they're not trained as a computer scientist or computer engineer. And so they make mistakes. What was the last time you backed up your system? Oh, could have been three years ago. I can't, I can't restore your file. Oh, OK. So we started thinking about this. And the other thing about this, and Brazil in particular, Brazil is what I call a vertical country. The United States is a horizontal country. We go east to west, we, north is Canada, south is Mexico. But we're all in what we call the temperate zone. Brazil straddles the equator. You go north to south. And a huge portion of Brazil has really hot weather. And in those buildings, you have electric space heaters. They sit sometimes underneath a person's desk, well, they sit on top of a person's desk. The person calls them computers, but they're not. They're space heaters. They use 350 or 450 watts of power, generating heat. If it's a gaming system, it uses 1,000 watts of power. My microwave oven uses 700 watts of power. You use more to play games than I use to cook food. Some gaming systems, 2,000 watts of power. They have, they have water cooling to cool their systems. And then they have this air conditioner on the wall that's taking the hot air in the room and blowing it out into the even hotter air outside. This is the essence of efficiency. And what are those, what are those systems doing? Most of the time they're doing nothing. They're cycling, nothing. This has got to change. Because in Brazil also is Itaipu, the world's largest hydroelectric plant, greater in capacity than three rivers in China. They don't want to build another Itaipu. Building the first one almost bankrupt Brazil. Building a second one probably will. So we have to do something about this. We have to reduce the amount of electricity we use, or at least keep it level. So what we decided for version 1.0 was to replace a lot of those very expensive computers with thin client computers and a server system in the basement that could grow with capacity as needed by the computing. We could cut the amount of electricity usage dramatically and make it a lot easier for people to use their computers. The entrepreneur would own all of those computers and simply sell computing services to the people in the buildings. There was a problem with this because the best time to install the networking to make this possible was when the building was being built. And it would be two years before there was time for the people to come in and actually use the services. What does a person do in between? So 
we stopped with that. We started with another idea. Let's sell some home media centers, giving people really good home media. I mean stellar home media. Douglas Conrad, who I mentioned before, he thought he had a great audio system until I took him and introduced him to what a great audio system was. And then he kind of came over to the dark side. We then decided to make this with the Raspberry Pi, creating a really great media center and the first connection to the Internet for a lot of people in Brazil who have no connection to the Internet. For the $35 computer and an LCD panel or a TV, they could be connected to the Internet and store all of their data out in the cloud having no maintenance whatsoever, no moving parts, absolutely quiet, create a security system, a home media system, and a home automation system. For lots of reasons that's too long to go into here, we had to put that aside. So now we've come up with version 0.0. .0. Notice I can't go into negative numbers. I refuse to go into negative numbers, no fractions. This is it. If this doesn't work, we stop. But we are, our business is to provide local entry-level support and services for small businesses, people from one to ten people in the office. And in the short term, provide jobs for university students. Now in Brazil and a lot of Latin American countries, public university is free. Private universities, although they charge, get a lot of scholarships provided by the government for deserving students. And yet, these students still cannot afford to go to university. Why? Because maybe they come from a very poor family. And they've been helping to support their family while they've been working in high school, doing various jobs and things like that, bringing in money. Or, it's simply the fact that when they move to the city from their small town, they need an apartment. They need to buy food. They need to have transportation money. They need to buy books. They need to buy equipment in order for them to have a university experience. And I've talked with some of the private university uh, presidents. They tell me that 40% of the people that's, that, that qualify for a full scholarship still cannot afford to go to university. Sometimes these students flip hamburgers to go through. Sometimes they take jobs on waiting tables. These are long hours for low pay. And so if we could develop and they are not necessarily in their job, in, the, in their career stream. They don't want to have a job after university waiting on tables or flipping hamburgers. So if we could create a job for them where they can make a lot of money in a short time that follows their career path so they're actually learning things while they do the job, this is a better thing for them. And it's a good thing for small business because they're taking advantage of the knowledge that these students already have. That these students, even if they're freshmen, have already known, have already been doing for their friends and family for the last 10 years. All of the long-term goals of Project Kawa still remain, and I'll show you how they will be done later on. Now, what types of services are we talking about for these small businesses? Taking the computer out of the box, installing it, getting it ready for the, for the business to use. Installing new software on there, making sure they have the proper device drivers and things for their operating system. Setting up the networking so that they have a decent network inside of the small company. A lot of times these small companies will have five or six or seven computers, all standalone, not networked together. They have no idea how to make them talk to each other. Remove viruses and spam off of the computers for them. Set up small server systems so they can tie their systems together. Create a website for the company so that they can advertise their goods. 
We cable the office for greater efficiency. I can't tell you the number of times I've walked into a small office. I pick up a cable off the floor. I says, what does this go to? And they go, I have no idea. But don't unplug it. Please don't unplug it. Something may stop. <laughs> Educate end users in how to use their software better and provide end user support for people's problems. Now, why university students? Because a lot of time, these students have been doing these types of things for years, for their family, for their friends, and things like that. And they need the money to continue with university. We feel that this fits their career goals better than other jobs they might take as student jobs. This could also be used for people who are physically handicapped, who are in wheelchairs or in crutches, or for single parents that's hard for them to leave their homes because of their children. A lot of this work could be done inside of their apartment or house, and they could hire somebody to do the things which they cannot physically do. I talk with a lot of professors, and they tell me, my students are already doing this, but they're doing it illegally. They're sharing their Wi-Fi illegally. We can show them how to do it and have a business, a legal business. What are the benefits of small business? Their computer hardware and software is kept up to date. I talked with one of the people who's doing this work, and they said they went into a small company, and the person was really mad because they just bought a computer, a brand new computer, and it was just the slowest thing they've ever seen. My student looked at this, found out that none of the proper device drivers had been installed on the system, so the main CPU was literally painting every pixel on the screen instead of using the graphical processing unit. He put in all the pro proper device drivers and the system came alive and the person was very happy with it. The business may save money on purchasing software and hardware because the entrepreneur becomes their advocate. He becomes their wholesaler. He can buy equipment for all of their customers at one time and get a factory discount on it. It reduces the amount of time that the computer is broken because the small business person typically waits until their computer doesn't work anymore. And then they bring it in to have it fixed. The entrepreneur can look at the logs, see that something is in the process of failing, and fix it before it fails. Here's a case where you don't have to go to find the support because the support comes to you. And this is typically a better backup than the skinny geek kid from next door. There's a benefit to the community, too, because it allows a greater number of really good students to get to go to university. The fact that a student cannot go to university when they have the talent and the skills and the knowledge and they simply lack the money is a crime against God. I would like to see that stopped. And it develops local high-tech jobs because these students will encourage more students to come in to supply the support that we so desperately need in a high-tech environment. People say, we don't need this anymore because everybody is going out to the cloud. Well, pardon me, I've been in the business for 45 years. I've seen the cloud before. And the cloud has never worked the way the cloud says it's going to work. We do need these technical people. And it allows the small business to be more efficient in their local computers. So this is how it's going to work. If you have a small business, one to 10 people in the office, the entrepreneur comes in and says, I will spend three hours every week, maybe four hours every week, in your business, doing anything you need to make your computers work better. Here is my list of skills. I can do these things. And for this amount of work, you pay me a small amount of money every month, perhaps 300 reais every month. If the entrepreneur then has six customers, 
they get 1,800 reais every month for basically 18 hours of work a week. If you add another hour in there for transportation back and forth to the customer, you're talking 24 hours a week that they're being paid 1,800 reais a month. How many of you make that much money flipping hamburgers at McDonald's? That's what I thought. And then, when you get finished with McDonald's, you're leaving McDonald's, do they give you a golden hamburger to thank you for the time you spent flipping hamburgers for them? With this job, you've created a business. You can sell it to an incoming freshman and get money to help you start your next job as you leave. This is a real business, and you are a real entrepreneur. So why don't more people do this? Why don't more? Well, some students do. They start little consulting companies, but they do it the wrong way. They do what we call the break and fix business. They sit there and wait for a customer to bring a broken computer to them, and then they fix it for them. And that's fine, but the problem is some months you may get a lot of things to be fixed, and other months you get nothing to be fixed. And the problem here is that every month your rent comes due. Every day you have to eat. You have, you know, your, your bills are constant. And you can't rely on the fact that next month there may be a lot of business. Plus, typically the time that there's a lot of business is a time that you're having exams. And you can't schedule your time that way. But with Project Kawa, you have a contract with the customer. The money comes in every month, constantly. And you can work with the customer to say, oh, this week I have exams, so can I come in extra time next, the week after to make up for it? You work with your customer because you have a relationship with them. And what Project Kawa would be working with you is to create a business management skills to show you how to make a contract, to give you the materials for doing marketing, to also supply, as your business grows, things like bug tracking systems, web-managed bug tracking systems to keep track of the problems that your customer has, Customer relationship management systems, so that as you go out to look for new customers, you can keep track of who you've talked to and who you want to uh, come back to again. Technical forums made up of other entrepreneurs that you can ask questions of. Or maybe if there's something you don't know how to do, you can find somebody in the forum and pay them to do that thing for you. Likewise, they may have something sometime that they don't know how to do, and they can pay you to do that for them. This is known as subcontracting, and we'll teach you how to do that. We'll give you the ability to do that. We're going to get together technical manuals and linkages in one place, so in case you have problems, you'll be able to find them. And we will develop new products and services that you'll be able to sell to your customers. For example, an ultra-cheap, ultra-efficient point-of-sale terminal system. We can do this, and we can pass this on to you virtually for free. Over time, as an entrepreneur, you're going to learn more and more skills, and you add those skills to your contracts for existing customers for more money. And likewise, it helps you to get new customers because you have more skills to offer them. And after you graduate, you have the choice of taking this business and expanding it into a full-time business, which we don't think that many will do, or sell your business to an incoming university student who will then take over your customers and provide support for them, and you take the money and start your new business. Now, recently, we started talking with universities about this, talking to their admissions uh, divisions, talking to their financial aid office. And the universities say, 
oh, we have a requirement for graduation now from the government to teach a course in entrepreneurship. This sounds like a perfect match that the students can elect to do Project Kawa and learn about entrepreneurship and practice entrepreneurship at the same time as getting credit from the university for the course. And I said, yes, I think that works out fine. So we're reaching out now to universities for the universities to provide us with students who would like to do this work. And we're also running into cities and townships who are trying to build technological parks where companies come in and start. But what do those companies ask? These companies say, we need good technical help to, keep our, to get our companies going. Where are they? And the cities say, well, we don't have anybody. Well, we have very few. And the companies say, goodbye. But now these companies are realizing that they have a hidden treasure in their high school and university students that they could provide a lot of the technical help that these companies need. And yes, it's not in programming or things like that, but it's a very good systems administration technical help, and in a lot of cases, even some good programmers. So we can bring these together and help cities and townships bring in new business. Now, we have a board of directors that are made up mostly of Brazilians. Uh, Daniel Coletti is from Argentina. That's because when we get Project Cala working in Brazil, we want to translate all of the materials into Spanish and start taking it to the Spanish-speaking countries of Latin America. And people say to me, well, Mad Dog, why not just do that right now? Well, we want to see if this really works. We want to provide the services that the entrepreneurs really need. And it's easy, it's just as hard to do this with a small country like Costa Rica as it is to do with a large country like Brazil. If I do it with Costa Rica, I've only affected 4 million people. If I do it with Brazil, I've affected 194 million people. And so, and Brazil is looked at by all of the other Latin American countries as an example. You are. The other, other non-Brazilian on here is Jody Newman. He's another American. He happens to be a lawyer working with telecommunications law and international telecommunications law. And I brought him on board because I want him to keep us out of legal trouble. Because telecommunications is one of the places you can get into a lot of legal trouble. We have a small technical board, which we hope to grow. Notice that many of these people in here are Debian. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But we want to build this up. And also, remember I said at the beginning, nothing about this said anything about free software. And how do I relate that with all these Debian people? Small business today uses Microsoft and Apple. You're not going to walk in there and say, Hi, I'm your Linux guy. I'm your BSD demon. You know, switch over, use me. Free software is so great. They're, going to, they're not going to believe you. They're going to shut the door on you so fast. It's going to be funny. But if you say to them, I can help you make your computers work better, and I will, I'm willing to work and make your Microsoft system work better, then they'll let you in the door. And when Microsoft says to them, oh, by the way, you, have to, you can't use XP anymore, you say, you know there's this thing called Linux? When Apple says, oh, I'm sorry, we're no longer supporting that latest, that MacBook you bought 10 years ago, you say, oh, there's this thing called Linux? When they say, I want to set up a website, you say, hey, don't use Microsoft and Microsoft SQL. I need a database. Don't use Microsoft SQL. Use Postgres or MySQL. That's when you start to bring free software into these companies. And then one day, when they've seen what you can do with free software, they will say, tell me some more about that Linux thing. 
And we will also bring a lot of people who only know Microsoft and Apple today into the free software community. The next steps, we're in the process of removing all of the version 1.0, version 0 0.5, and version 0 0.1 things from the website, updating it for this new model. And we started piloting this in a few cities. There's been a couple people doing this type of work, particularly in Sao Paulo. And we want to start expanding this now, particularly in the Florinopolis area, but also here in Porto Alegre. And we want to open it up to larger numbers of people. So that's why here at FISL, I'm going to do some training tomorrow, or actually today, between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock in room 40A. And unlike this talk, this talk has been, what is Project Kawa? Why is it good? Why should you be doing it? But the talk here is how to do Project Kawa, how to be an entrepreneur, how to make this money, and to show you that even though in the back of your mind you're saying, I could not possibly do this, you can. You can possibly do this. And I'm not saying that every single one of you is going to be a good Project Kawa entrepreneur because this is hard work. You're going to have to go and knock on the door of these small business people and you're going to have to say, you need my help and you're going to have to stick that flyer in your hands. You're going to have to visit a hundred small businesses before the first one says, maybe I'll try you. But then you'll have that first customer, and that will feel so good. And then you'll go and you'll knock at the door of 50 more, and you'll say, would you like to try me out? And you can say, oh, by the way, this person's using me. And now you'll get your second one. Now you only need four more. And if you keep those customers happy, they'll keep signing that contract month after month, year after year until you're ready to graduate. One more thing before I stop. I told you the goals of Project Kawa were the same as with version 1.0, and they are. So you, as a Project Kawa entrepreneur going to university, in your sophomore year, your second year, you find a building which is being built. You go down to City Hall, you find a permit that's been given, you find the person building that building, and you convince them to put the networking into the building that needs to be there. Then two years later, when that building is built, you go back there and you say, now I'm ready. I'm graduating next year. I'm going to buy the servers. I'm going to buy the thin clients, and I'm going to supply the people in your building, the computing services, and they will pay me every month for that. Taking care of that building will probably take you at most 10 hours a week. But yet it could supply a very good base salary for you to build the rest of your business on. Writing programs, solving people's problems. And you would make a very, very good living out of computing science and services. So now, you're welcome to come to listen to the talk between 1 and 3. And after that, if you believe what I'm saying about Project Kawa, then I would invite you to go to the website and register. Everybody will be able to read anything on the website forever. This is an open project. The only time you have to register is when you want to participate in Project Kawa and you want to talk on the websites. And we do that because we want to keep a civil environment. We want to make people to be professionals. But there is no charge for that either, and there never will be. And the third thing, the third level, is being a, a real Project Kawa entrepreneur. 
I should explain this a little bit. If you want to make hamburgers, it's easy. You get a license from the city, says I'm going to cook hamburgers. You go down to the store, you buy some hamburger meat, you buy some rolls, you build your little stand or your little cart, you get your cooker, you cook hamburgers. Great. And you can probably make a decent living cooking hamburgers. But if you want to be McDonald's, with the golden arches, and having people pushing their way into the store to have the crappiest hamburger in the world, that's known as a franchise. And even if you say that the hamburger is crappy, it is consistently crappy. People know what they're getting. They don't have to worry that they're going to get a really good hamburger. Likewise with Project Kawa. If you want to be a Project Kawa entrepreneur, you're going to have to agree to a certain level of ethics. You're going to have to say that I, prov I will provide good service for my customers. I will meet their needs, reasonable needs. I will maintain myself in a certain professional environment. And then you can become a Project Kawa entrepreneur and you can use the Project Kawa symbol and you can use Project Kawa in your name. But if we find that you're not providing good service, your customers are all complaining, then we'll take away that right to use Project Kawa. And you'll lose the benefits of being in the Project Kawa enterprise. And there's no charge for that either. That also will be free. We have figured out how to run Project Kawa with no money coming from Project Kawa entrepreneurs. Therefore, every penny that you make, every hour that you spend, goes into your pocket, not paid to some boss or shareholder or company. It goes into your pocket. And the harder you work, the more money you make. That's what entrepreneurship is about. That's what capitalism is about. God bless Brazil. Thank you very much. <laughs>
but the other one does not have a penalty clause. What it has is what we call prepayment of services. So that basically in the first month, the customer gets charged more money per month. In the second month, they get charged a normal amount of money. In the third month, they get charged nothing. So if the customer cancels the contract after the first month, the entrepreneur walks away with a significant amount of money for doing one month's work. If they cancel after the second month, the entrepreneur has just the amount of money that they would normally get. If they cancel after the third month, then there's, there's nothing lost. And what this, now, now normally the customers would say, I can't afford to pay the money that you're asking in the first month. So what we do in the contract is we spread the payment out over the three months. So the customer pays the same amount of money every month, but they, they, they get the charges up front. So this is perfectly legal. It's a way of writing a contract, but it allows you to write a contract with no penalty clause after the first month. And it's these type of things that we bring as Project Cower experience to the Project Cower entrepreneurs. Now, last month in a conference in, in Florinopolis, we signed up about 40 people to be entrepreneurs. And I do not have the results of what happens with those 40 people. It may be that 20 of them never do anything with Project Cower. They never go out, they never knock on doors, they never show the advertisements, they never try and make it work. Out of, the, out of the 20 people that do, maybe only 10 are successful. In which case, we have 10 successful entrepreneurs. We have perhaps on the average of 60 successful businesses. And that represents perhaps 300 terminals or workstations that you can sell services and support to. If here at Feastly I was to get 200 people attend the talk, I might get 100 which would actually be serious about Project Kawa, 50 who would actually try, 25 who might be successful. That means 300 businesses that I've helped. I started off this talk by saying, with, if I reached its entire potential, I could create between a million and two million jobs. That would mean 12 million businesses that I have helped to supply computer support to. But let's say I don't reach 100%. Maybe I only do 1%. 1% of a million is 10,000. I've helped 10,000 students go to university. I've helped 60,000 businesses work, use their computers better. Do you think I could sleep at night? I think I could sleep at night. But I used a million to two million because that is the potential. And I believe that this would work. And I believe that people will learn a lot from being a Project Kawa entrepreneur. And I believe there will be more university students who can afford to go to university that could not afford before. Thank you. Next, please. Bom dia a todos. Eu já trabalho numa empresa de informática que presta assistência para os clientes, e, mas acontece isso, de estragar o equipamento e o cliente levar até nós. A ideia seria, ao invés de evitar esse tempo, inclusive que o cliente vai ficar sem o equipamento, você fazer o conserto, na verdade, evitar, remediar, já resolver o conserto na empresa. Seria um atendimento, uma empresa que atende especificamente na empresa a domicílio, enfim, mas não, não teria um espaço físico, talvez, para você fazer o trabalho, faria na empresa do cliente? Uh, 
That's right. And what we want to do with Project Kawa is create the relationship between the entrepreneur who's going to the office of the small company and the small company itself. The entrepreneur and the small company negotiate the time that the entrepreneur shows up. It may be that the entrepreneur shows up at the, between the hours of 7 and 8 o'clock or between the hours of 5, 5 o'clock in the morning and 7 o'clock. Or they show up after the small business closes and they do their work. Or maybe it's on the weekend that they do their work. So the small business does not need their computer there. We are hoping, too, that the, we can set it up so that the entrepreneur can actually monitor the small computers from their house and do a lot of the work, like looking at logs, seeing if things are going bad, from their house. If they see a disk drive filling up, they can call up the customer and say, what are you doing? You know, Your, your, your disk drive is filling up. We either need to archive some of your data or I need to give you, get you a bigger disk drive the next time I'm there. So this is preventive maintenance. But the other thing we want to do is to align some of these entrepreneurs with companies like yours. That there will be things these entrepreneurs can't do that your company has the expertise to do. And so you can use these entrepreneurs as your first line of support for, the customer, for your customers. That's perfectly okay. And you work out a business deal with these entrepreneurs to do that. So this may actually bring your company more business and a higher level of business than you've been doing before. I've run into this question before, and it's a good question. Thank you. Next question, please. What? Well, I'm told we don't have any more time for questions. But if you come to my talk from 1 to 3, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Thank you very much.